Let me click that. Okay, so hello and welcome to the skill builder session on tips for reading a scholarly article. My name is Christopher Bishop. I'm a librarian here at Agnes Scott. And we're going to walk through and talk about just some practical things to do with this. Some things you may be familiar with, others you may not. Again, feel free to ask questions, interject as we go. First thing uh, I find sometimes with students is identifying the types of periodicals. And I don't know how often or if this is ever, you know, you may have heard the term periodicals before and been like, hmm, I don't know exactly what that's referring to. Basically, a periodical can be a magazine, a newspaper, a scholarly journal, a trade journal. It's something that comes out periodically. So it could be every day, could be once a week, could be once a month. It could be yearly, but that's what periodicals literally means periodically. Um, and when you're looking at this chart, and I won't go through everything here, but since we're looking at scholarly journals, scholarly journals are, uh, they're pretty different from magazines and newspapers or trade journals in that a magazine and a new, or a newspaper usually is going to be written, uh, the articles are going to be written by a reporter or a journalist who is, is probably well-versed in their area, but not in the same way that a scholarly journal, which would be a researcher, a scholar, someone who that's their specialty, uh, oftentimes has a PhD, uh, teaches or does something else in that field. So there's a higher level of knowledge and understanding. And then, Again, with a magazine and newspaper, usually the purpose is just to generally um, inform you of what's going on, entertain, persuade. It's not really meant for depth. It's more to give you an overview. Whereas with a scholarly journal article, it's really more about research, education, communication. It's going to be in-depth. It's going to oftentimes be on a very specific um, topic and they're usually much longer than a magazine or a newspaper article. And the way I always think of it is with magazines and newspapers, there's certainly credible publications like Time, Newsweek, those are very credible, but they're not scholarly. Um, so they're a good place to get started to understand a topic, but they're just not gonna have that depth of uh, knowledge or information by the person writing the articles. And then again, I think sometimes students um, will feel a, a bit stressed by scholarly articles is that the writing is going to be formal. It's going to be sophisticated. It's going to be technical. We'll talk about some things that you can use to help you in reading these as, before we break down what how a scholarly article works, but just know that's understood, which is why sometimes you want to start with something that's a little more basic and then you can move into scholarly research. And then a scholarly journal is also, it's, the sources are always going to be cited. There's always going to be footnotes and there's always going to be a bibliography. Sometimes a magazine or a newspaper may have some citations, but not always. Uh, scholarly journals also almost never have advertising other than maybe an announcement for a conference or other publications, but otherwise there's usually not. And then uh, graphics, you will see tables, graphs, statistical information presented. Again, you may see that in a magazine or a newspaper, but not as likely. And then publishers of scholarly journals are usually going to be uh, professional organizations, universities, nonprofit organizations, things like that. And at the bottom there, you see some examples. Uh, the way we used to think of this is basically a magazine or a newspaper was something that you could buy at the checkout stand at a grocery store. You still see that sometimes, uh, now less so, whereas a scholarly journal is really something you're probably going to get through a library or a professor may have in their office or something like that, but you're I have never seen a scholarly journal for sale at a grocery store. So that's another one. And then trade journals, those are um, going to be journals that feature news and practical information related to a specific profession or occupation. And you can see here, like advertising age, that's really for people that work in the advertising industry. And those may be helpful too. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay. Okay, so one thing I find that students often have problems with also is just reading a citation from a database. So when you're in a database, a journal is always going to include this information. If it doesn't, mm, there's something odd going on. Uh, when you find a journal title, say through a Google search, it should have this information too. If it doesn't have this information, I would probably question whether it's actually a scholarly journal or not. 
First thing is going to be the article title that's usually going to be at the top. In this case, we're going to look at an article called Associations Between Adolescent Siblings, Relationship Quality and Similarity and Differences in Values. Then it's going to tell you the authors. In this case, this article has three authors. Sometimes you might have one author. I have seen chemistry publications with, and I'm not exaggerating, a thousand authors. Uh, so it can be one to thousands. And in this case, it tells you who the individuals are affiliated with. So for example, Tina Kretschmer is associated with the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College, United Kingdom. And then uh, Allison Pike is University of Sussex, Brighton in England. And then down here, you've got the source. This is where I find students oftentimes have a hard time deciphering this, but it's, it's relatively simple. Basically, this is the name of the journal. So this is Journal of Family Psychology. This is going to be the volume number, and then this is going to be the issue number, and this is going to be the date it was published on, and these are the pages it falls on. So even though I would be accessing this electronically as a PDF, it's still there's a print publication, and if I went to that print publication, which you probably wouldn't, but in the past, that's the way you would have accessed it, it would be on these pages. And again, sometimes you, in other styles, you may see a 24 and then dot four. The first one's always the volume number and the next one's always the issue number. The reason that this is important is if I have this, and even if you don't give me the URL, web address or something else to find it, as long as I have this information, I can always find this journal. I don't need anything else other than well, technically, I don't even need the author or the article title. If I have this, I can find it without this other information. Whereas if I have just the article title, I'd have to do a little more looking to find it. If I just had the authors, that would be more problematic. I would have to do some even more searching. Okay, and then next up, I want to talk about when you're looking at an article, really what you're focusing in on is what is your research question because your research question is going to decide on whether you use the article and how you use the article and as we go through this in a moment and we just kind of take apart an article the first thing is read out of order and you may think that's odd like wait a minute isn't the article in a certain order because that's the order i'm supposed to read it in no you actually break up the parts and oddly enough you know again we'll talk about this in a moment the abstract is certainly the first thing you should read in the introduction, but then you should go down and read the conclusion and then work your way back up to what would be the middle parts of the paper. The reason being is that reading it out of order will help you to understand these concepts, even if you're unfamiliar with them. Um, another thing I think is hugely important is to look up words or terms you're unfamiliar with. It, it, there's nothing wrong with seeing terms that you that just seem alien to you doing a search. It could be a Google search. You could look in an encyclopedia, even a dictionary and just see, okay, what does this word mean? And what is the context for it? I oftentimes too, I am uh, not a science person. So if I am looking at science articles, oftentimes I have to look up a number of the terms too. But if you don't look up the terms and you don't really understand what the terminology is saying, it's gonna be much harder to understand the gist of the article. Uh, this may, be a little surprising, but question everything you read. These are scholarly articles, which means they've gone through a peer review process, which means other people in that field have reviewed the content to say, uh, basically find out, is this reliable information? Do they make a sound argument? Do they have good sources? But still, you still want to, as you're reading it, you still want to question, you still want to say, hmm, does this make sense? Does this seem plausible? Are they proving their point? You still want to do that. Although again, with scholarly journal articles, you shouldn't be running into those problems. Another thing is, does the article help you to answer your research question? If you're reading through it and you read the abstract and you find that, you know what, this just doesn't really pertain to what I'm doing, then you don't need to read any further. And I think sometimes students honestly kind of waste a bit of time reading through articles, the whole thing, and then finding out, you know what, this just really doesn't pertain to my research question. You could certainly set it aside. Maybe your research question changes in some way and you come back to it. But otherwise, reading a whole article that doesn't 
really pertain to what you're doing is honestly a waste of your time. So that's another reason we're going to talk about how you break these down into a certain order. And then also you're looking for you're engaging with it. Obviously, this person's an expert, but you're also looking for how you can expand on these ideas. What is your argument and how are you going to inform your own argument with the research that you're reading? It shouldn't just be a regurgitation of what you're reading, but more so, okay, here's an expert. How can I build on these ideas? And then another thing that's hugely important that I find sometimes people overlook are the keywords. In an article, usually most scholarly articles, I would say 90%, are going to list keywords. And basically, these are usually supplied by the author. It may be supplied by the platform that's uh, supplying the article to you, like through the database. But it gives you an idea that if I search for sibling relationship, there's a good chance this article would come up if I was limiting it to scholarly uh, research. Same thing for sibling, sibling similarity and difference and then value acquisition. These are super helpful too when you're trying to expand your own search or maybe even narrow it. These keywords, super helpful. This is the terminology that'll help you find similar information. So again, sometimes this gets overlooked and can be really helpful for your own searches. Okay, so when we're getting into the article, the first thing I would argue the most important thing that you have to read is the abstract. All scholarly journals, for the most part, I'm sure there's a couple of exceptions that I'm just not thinking of, include an abstract. And basically what the abstract does is it covers the basics of the article. It's not going to tell you everything, but it's going to tell you what they were researching, probably why they were doing it. And then it's going to tell you, it's going to give you a very brief overview of the conclusion or the findings. Again, if this just does not pertain to your research question, what you're reading in the abstract, it's probably not going to be helpful and you probably don't need to read any further. Um, and these are usually written by the author of the article. It's usually submitted with that. And some questions to think about with the abstract is what is this article about? And certainly the abstract will tell you that. And then what is the working hypothesis or thesis? Somewhere in here, they should tell you what they're trying to argue, what they're trying to prove. And in the conclusion, they'll usually tell you whether they proved it or not. And then again, is this related to my question or area of research? If it isn't, you really don't need to proceed any further with the article. Next thing to read after you've read that abstract is the introduction. This is going to be sometimes, you know, they'll write introduction. Usually, though, it'll just be the lead in to the article that'll lay a foundation for what the article is about. That's going to be the first few paragraphs of a journal article sort of that introduces the topic, provides the author's main arguments, uh, the hypothesis, the thesis, um, and to indicate why the research was done. Again, here's some questions is you want to ask, what do we already know about this topic and what is left to discover? Uh, what have other people done in regards to this topic? We'll talk a little bit more about a literature review, which will be included, but this is going to give you some context for that. Um, how is this research unique? When you're looking at a scholarly article, one of the things they're going to tell you in the conclusion is that they're trying to analyze, solve, find a solution for something that has not been done in this way before. If it's not something unique, usually it wouldn't be published in a scholarly article. So again, what about this is unique? Um, and then again, for you personally, it's, will this tell me anything new related to my research question? Is there something I'm finding here that I haven't seen in other places? If it repeats things that you find elsewhere, there's probably not really a reason to use it because you already have that information elsewhere. And again, just to kind of expand on this hypothesis or thesis statement, this is going to be their main argument. Now, in this example, they literally say, we hypothesize that PDDIs were more prevalent in the elderly, not only because of exposure to a higher number of drugs, et cetera. Sometimes they'll do that, but a lot of times they don't. So oftentimes it's up to you to read through that introductory paragraphs to determine what the authors are proposing. So they may not say, in fact, I would say usually they're not gonna say my thesis is, my hypothesis is. Rather, they're going to 
in that introduction give you an idea of what they're going to argue, what they're trying to prove. I think sometimes, though, what happens is we're laying out these articles and saying, oh, you're always going to find these parts. And it's always going to be in this order. And sometimes that doesn't happen, just like there's going to be some things we're going to talk about that you may find in an article, but some scholarly articles may not have those parts. So this one that I'm using is a very full article that includes all the parts that you could possibly find in a scholarly article, but sometimes some of this may be missing. So the discussion analysis, this is the next part you're reading. So you've read the abstract, you've read the discuss, you've read the abstract and then the introduction, and then you're jumping down in the paper. So you're skipping the literature review, the methodology, which we'll talk more about. And you're going down to the discussion and the analysis. And this section gives discussion, conclusions, implications of the research. Here, the authors summarize what the results of the research might mean to the field, how the research addresses the original hypothesis, weaknesses of the study, and recommendations for future research about the topic. This is where they explain things. This is when other things don't make sense. The discussion helps you to understand it. I would also almost argue that you could technically, after the abstract, begin with the discussion and then go back to the introduction. I would probably read the introduction first, but just know the discussion, super helpful for understanding how they came to these conclusions, what they're arguing, and how they did it. Um, next up you want to read is the conclusion. And this is going to be those concluding statements. It may be where they're going to talk about research they may want to do in the future or something like that. Um, some questions to ask here are, what does the study mean and why is it important? What are the weaknesses in their argument? And in that conclusion, they may point to uh, what those weaknesses are, but you may find some things that you think are kind of glaring. Again, that's up to you. Find your those points of analysis. And then is the conclusion valid? Again, it's in a scholarly journal. It should, uh, it, it will have been peer reviewed. It will have gone through a whole process, but you still may say, you know, I just don't know if these conclusions are really valid. Or you may say, you may find one point to be, you may be skeptical about it, but other things you find to be valid. It's okay to do that. In fact, that's where you oftentimes can um, add to your own research is by finding these gaps, these holes, these things that you don't feel are explained properly. And then the methodology, again, I would go back into the article after I've read these other parts and look at the methodology. And this is gonna be, um, Basically, it's going to tell you how they went about doing it. Let's say if it was a study done on a group of people, then they're going to tell you the age ranges. They're going to tell you the type of studies they did, what kind of conditions were they were done under. This is super important. Basically, the reason they're telling you the methodology is so that if you wanted to, you could repeat what they had done to see what your outcomes are. So your outcomes may not be the same, but it basically creates a base. Um, and some things that you'd want to think about here is how did the author do the research? Is it a qualitative or quantitative project? So qualitative refers to more, um, usually when you'll see that, it'll be more numbers. Uh, basically, they've said, oh, out of 10 people, this number of people had this outcome and this number of people had an alternate outcome. That would be quantitative. And then qualitative is where you may interview 10 people and then you're looking at the results of the interview for your findings. And that's another thing. Oftentimes, articles won't tell you whether they're quantitative or qualitative. It's usually up to you to read the article and then determine which they are. Uh, and then another question to ask is, what data is the study based on? So if they're making these broad observations and findings about a whole population, but they only used five people in a study, that's probably a red flag. That would seem odd to me. That could be a difference between quantitative and qualitative. Qualitative oftentimes has less study participants than a quantitative one. Um, but again, that's something to look at. And, and as I said before, it's also, could I repeat the work? Does the methodology let me know how they did it so that I can repeat it? And again, you may get different outcomes, but I have to be able to repeat what they did. If I can't repeat it, then it's not really valid. And then the results, 
that's going to be one of the last things you'll read to. And again, that's what happened. Um, and this is going to be what the researchers learn. Um, if the graphs and statistics, which you'll find oftentimes in these are confusing, this will help to explain them uh, similar to the discussion. And some things again here you'll want to look for questions to ask is, what did the author find and how did they find it? Are the results presented in a factual and unbiased way? Does their analysis agree with the data presented? Is all the data present? And what conclusions do you formulate from the data? Again, those are all going to be your inferences and insights, reading critically. And a part that I find oftentimes uh, people will overlook is the references, the work cited, the bibliography. This is going to lead you to other resources. This is what they use to support their arguments. It could be examples of what they were um, analyzing or presenting. Uh, also with these, they'll always be, they may use a different kind of citation format, but they're always going to give you the author. It should be the year of publication, the title. If it's a website, they'll give you the URL, things like that. So if you're looking at an article and you are told to find something fairly recent and you find that all of their research is from the 1980s, I would probably wonder why didn't you find something more current? So I know that's another thing to look at references, but that's one of the last things you have to look at. And then the literature review, which usually is going to be in an article, the literature review is going to be up at the top. Usually it's going to come after the introduction, but I'm telling you to look at it last. And the reason I'm telling you to look at it last is because it's it can be helpful for finding other sources um, that have been written in this area to see who they were looking at, how they um, established that uh, contextual research, things like that. But unless you're doing that, if you're just reading the article, say you're reading the article for class or you're using it for a paper, you probably aren't looking at the literature review. Just know that as you get more advanced and you are writing your own literature reviews, this is something you'll want to look at to see how others have done it. And it also, the, another thing to look for in the literature review is you'll find in certain fields, in certain areas of study, there's going to be authors that you pretty much have to include, that they are standards for the field. If you're looking at a literature review and you're not seeing those individuals, that should be a red flag. And then how to take notes. These are just some suggestions. I often find, I think students are really good at doing this, at printing an article or highlighting it online. If you have a PDF, in case uh, people aren't familiar, you can use, there's a highlight text feature in Adobe Reader that you can use and then save the document. I know some students like to print them out. And as I think you all know, you get $35 in free print credit. So you certainly could, uh, but if not, Again, you can use that tool in Adobe Reader. I also think there too, I see sometimes students will highlight basically the whole article. I would probably say it's better to highlight the things that you feel are of most importance and then take notes on other things so that you can have those in your own words or your own ideas. If you're highlighting everything, it kind of negates what those main points are. Again, this is the idea of highlighting those those big ideas and then taking notes. For example, it says in the margin, there's also in Adobe Reader, there's a pop up sticky notes uh, to help you understand things. I find too, if you put things in your own words, if you summarize them or paraphrase them, it really helps with retention of information. Especially when you if you can take, you know, a whole paragraph of information and summarize it in a sentence after say highlighting what those high points are, super helpful in making sure that you really understand what you've read. And then in the future, you can go back, read those notes and not have to read the whole article again, or at least the parts of the articles that you consulted. Um, and it, these, this last part, part uh, highlight only very important closer terms, already referred to that, and then summarize the main or key points. Summarizing is vastly underrated. It is a huge, huge help to understanding what you're reading. It also clarifies two things that you need to look up. Because if you don't understand those terms when you're trying to summarize it, then it definitely means you need to look for some kind of outside source that'll help you to understand. And then as far as reflecting on what you've read, and I think this is hugely important too, and I know I'm, I, I keep bringing up this point, but 
have you taken the time to understand all the terminology? Hugely important. If you don't look those up, define them. I mean, effectively, like what you probably were used to doing in high school, or where you would have a definition sheet. It, it really does help in college too. Um, two of the if you're reading the whole article, that's fine, but if you're spending a lot of time on the methodology, but that's really not pertinent to your research question, you can probably move on. It's that whole adage, work smarter, not harder. It's what do you really need from the article? Um, and then next, do I have any reason to question the credibility of this research? Most times you probably won't, but again, you may find that something's overlooked. Maybe it's maybe another researcher has covered this area and reading something else will help to inform that. Maybe this just wasn't the focus of their research, but it is going to be hugely important to engage and think about what's not included or whether there's a problem with, again, that credibility. Um, and then again, the specific problem that the research addresses and why is it important? I would almost say in the end, I wouldn't almost say, I would say, in the end, basically coming away with a couple of sentences or even a paragraph as to what you think the big takeaways are, why is this important? When you're discussing this um, in class, you're discussing the article, or you're talking about uh, a resource in a paper, those ideas will be hugely helpful because later on, you know, you may not use this article for weeks afterwards and then you're not remembering what that big takeaway was so i would do that too and then finally and probably the most important point is how these results relate to my research interest or to other works which i have read again you're thinking about you're going to read this body of literature so you may read 10 different articles and you're like oh okay this is really interesting because it talks about this aspect and i read these other two articles that talk about these aspects how can i combine them and i don't want to talk too much about a literature review, but when you're looking at different source materials and you're trying to answer a research question that you have, oftentimes what you're going to find is that there's some gap. Like, okay, this researcher, researcher is talking about this and this other researchers are talking about this other thing. And there's some crossover there, like a Venn diagram basically, but I'm gonna bring them together. It's, it's my analysis that's going to make them uh, correlate in a way that they don't currently. So that's another thing. And then lastly, um, all of this comes from two guides that are very good that were published by the Defiance College Library and then the Cayuga Community Colleges Library. Are there any questions or I guess ideas, interpretations, or things that may seem um, that I didn't answer, basically. Nope. Okay. Well, I will send you this uh, PowerPoint. And this will, and then uh, also the recording probably, and then this will also be posted on the Skill Builder site. And this is going to be part one. The next installment on Monday will be about how to write a literature review. And then we're going to have um, other pieces of this in the future too. So this is kind of the first installment. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you everybody and I will stop recording. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.